Hey, I'm glad you're here. Welcome to the Mission Manhood Podcast. My guest for episode 21 is Dr. Corey Castillo. In the episode, he explains the difference that he sees between a boy, a man, and a father. And part of his explanation for the father included this quote, Are you convicted by such a powerful, absolute truth that you will serve it even when no one sees it and even when people hate you for it? At this current moment that we find ourselves in in history, I think that's so important for each one of us to ponder. What is it, what truth that we are willing to stand for and with, regardless of who else stands with us and regardless of who we lose in pursuit of that truth? I thank you so much for joining me. I also invite you. I have a couple of new episodes of the Deepening Place podcast published. I share some of my wisdom as a therapist and part of my story. And with the Deepening Place and the Mission Manhood podcast, I thank you for your support. Hi, Corey. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you today? Good, good. Thanks for making the time. Yeah, thank you for for being here. Um, Can you tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? What I do specific to this conversation would probably fall in the world of executive coaching, although my professional background is more so a business strategist and operations leader. Mm-hmm. Um, however, having been an executive coach for about six years now, um, I've worked with a lot of uh, leaders in small to mid-sized businesses and in helping them to enhance their performance. And in that process, I've uh, developed an affinity towards men's work. And I know that's what led us to, to have our yeah. conversation. Uh, and so that's something that I've, that I've done I should, probably on the side, if you will, separate from my standard executive coaching. Uh, so that might be facilitating men's retreats, uh, men's ministry, uh, men's summits, uh, and doing a lot of one-on-one counsel as well for men in business, as well as men in the church. What was instrumental for you and as far as your development in that arena? I should say what probably strike my interest is twofold. One, really being curious around our decision-making processes, meaning when you've got a tribe of people operating together, and let's say let's say we call that an organization or we call that a group or business, um, there's this natural exchange of, of communication, explicit and implicit, that, that falls on our decision-making. So sometimes we're in lose-lose situations or we have to make crappy decisions. It's how do we go about assuming the responsibility for those decisions? And how do we look to our decision-making criteria, perhaps we call that values, uh, to go about making the greatest decision for the tribe? And what I noticed is that throughout that process, there's different tiers of maturity, if you will, in those decision-making moves. So for example, a less matured leader might make a save my ass decision with, with a lot of short sightedness, whereas a more seasoned leader might make a, I'm going to take the hit for my team and bite the bullet decision. Um, both speaking to the same scenario, but different decisions for different reasons based on different people. And so that really strike my interest there. Um, so that would be part number one. Part number two would probably be seeing how the role of a man and the role of a woman has evolved um, and and changed over the last few years quite drastically. And with the belief that the masculine pole and the feminine pole are inescapable in in life and, and the duality that we live in, I've become very interested on how to uphold a very strong and synergistic balance from the perspective of a man. Those two areas of focus being the decision-making and the, the balance between the masculine and the feminine have prompted me to take a deeper dive into men's work. In a lot of ways, you kind of described for different reasons what I try to help people do, sort of identifying that level of maturity And then the balance of, I think we talked about in an earlier conversation, the four archetypes of 
uh, mature masculinity, that king, the warrior, the magician, and the lover. Also, you know, I talk about constantly the divine dance between the masculine and feminine and yeah. allowing that flow. You know, just getting into this space, one of the, the main reasons was, you know, my concern for what I consider to be a crisis in masculinity. Men feeling bad about doing what their nature is calling them to do. Yeah, you know, and it's it's interesting where that might come from. I mean, our nature is our nature. I, I mean, looking at it from just a, a raw human lens, we are what we are, and we cannot change what we are. We have to manage what we are, and we do that by adhering to behavioral frameworks, models, traditions, cultural structures, so on and so forth. But we can't suppress what we are, nor can we override it. In, in my interpretation, that would be as just as challenging as trying to override the law of gravity. It's like yeah. we can't override what we inherently are. Within, within this context, I mean, some, some folks would push back on that with, with some nuance and perhaps might have a point. But from within the context that we're discussing, I think it's a very sobering reality to go, okay, this is what it is to be human. Now, how do we best take that reality and integrate it into our daily lives? One thing that back to the stages of maturity, you had a post, I think it was back in February, that sort of outlined what you've broken down, like the boy, the man, and the father. And I wondered if you could define each one. Yeah, the the way I, I the way I packaged that was the boy seeks to to serve his image, the man seeks to serve his kin, and the father seeks to serve for sake of serving for, for because he adheres to a, a greater value. I also I think I mentioned that the the boy will serve for recognition of his own image, the the man mm-hmm. will serve for recognition of his tribe, and the father serves for no recognition at all. The, the context there is that we all have a boy, a man, and a father in us. It's which one are we a little more of and for what reasons? And when do we activate the fight of the boy or the support of the man or the grace of the father? And I say father there speaking literally and figuratively. If we look at men whom still embrace a heavy emphasis on boyhood, you'll see that they still act in their own image. It's still look at me some folks might refer to that as the prince, then when they assume greater responsibilities and they're actually responsible for for those under them, whether it's an imposed responsibility or an assumed responsibility that they've chosen to elect, it's not necessarily look at me anymore. They're held responsible for the performance and the results of the collective. So their decision-making has to be less them, more for the betterment of others. But then most most folks would probably say, okay, well, you know, that's leadership, and they might kind of sew that in there. But then I'm thinking of the level that's above that, and which is what I was referring to as the father there. You go, well, what about serving when folks don't even know you're serving? They might never know you're serving. What about serving when folks might even hate that you're serving, that might hate you? Can you still practice the grace to serve anyway? I think that's ultimately the father. You know, we think about literal fathers that have uh, children that are rebellious teenagers. It's like, well, I've, I've got to take care of this teenager despite their rebellion and their their disregard for my serving them. But then let's let's take it a step further and, and go, okay, well, what about the father? And when I, I'm referring to God, and when I say that, I'm referring to God, not just in a religious sense, but a philosophical or psychological sense. What about a figure that's given us all, and even in our rebellion against everything that we have, for whatever reason, that figure still gives us that. That's like the ultimate grace. It's how do we move from the boy to the man to pursuing uh, the grace of a father and upholding that. And that's where I think it's not a one and done. It's got to be maintained every day. I really love that. And I had kind of become stuck in looking at the stages of development as kind of more concrete, like you move from one to the next. Yeah. But what really caught my eye about that post and my conversations with you since then is it's sort of a flow and you consciously deciding where you need to be. As a parent, 
that becomes apparent to me because that's how I deal with my children. And sometimes like the playful, what you would be calling the boy. And sometimes I'm serving, but it's like making things nice for Christmas. And I'm getting lots of good kudos for that. Everybody's like, oh, it looks so great. Oh, thank you for making the brownies. But then there are times where I very consciously said, I love you enough to allow you to hate me. Yes. Because I can zoom out and see, and I'm going to have to set some boundaries here. Yeah. I, I think that would probably differentiate between the man piece and the father piece, because if the man component seeks to serve his tribe, there is still that pressure for your tribe to like you. Whereas the father piece is, I don't care if you like me because I'm serving you with what's best. And the grace would then come in where you might hate me for it. I think tying that to what we're seeing today socioculturally is that there's a hell of a lot greater demand to be liked than valued. It's hey, I I, I want everyone to like me. I want this popularity and I want to create this facade that suggests that I'm all things to all people everywhere. And it's this, it metastasizes into this false sense of nobility, this kind of fabricated humility, as opposed to what you described earlier, saying, hey, you're going to hate me for this, but I'm okay with that. And I think that's what we're craving, is being okay with being disliked one of my favorite movies was uh, White Men Can't Jump with Woody Harrelson. Do you remember yeah. that? I remember the movie, but I don't think I ever saw it. It's a great movie. Uh, he Woody Harrelson looks at Wesley Snipes and he says, you know, you you would rather, I think the quote is, you would rather look good and lose than to look bad and win. And right now, as I think about where our uh, larger culture is, there's a lot more emphasis on looking good despite the repercussions of that, than to an acceptance in looking bad, but having a more functional, healthier culture at a macro level and at a micro level. Micro being the family and the relationship, macro being obviously the community. You had a quote, the father works for what is true, regardless of glory received, both literally Mm. and figuratively. I just what you're just saying, the father works for what is true always. Yeah. It's one of those things that you, you never really get there, but you're always perfecting it in terms of, of that level of grace. It's, are you convicted by such a powerful, absolute truth that you will serve it even when no one sees it and even when people hate you for it? And I think that's just beautiful. I think that's where glory comes from. There is such a thing as suffering without glory, but there is no such thing as glory without suffering. In pursuing such a beautiful, absolute truth, you're going to suffer. And that suffering is going to come from slander, ridicule, scrutiny, perhaps from the people closest to you. And that's just the price of glory. Yeah. You know? In society and culture currently, that desire to be perceived as virtuous without without really fighting for what's true and i think we're pushing up against where it's going to it's going to be necessary for men especially to stand up for what they know to be true and mm-hmm. we've had that those standards when you talk about the tribe we've had so many standards taken away from us and to be considered a christian is now kind of looked down upon to the Constitution is now, you know, in question. Even quoting Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is is questionable now. So yeah. all of these things that we were reaching for, like the highest good, reaching for on a shelf, it's been dismantled, and now people are like, "Wait, what are we, what are we going for?" And to reestablish some of those values for the tribe, I think is going to be important moving forward. When I reflect on that, and obviously it can be disheartening to see a lot of that. But one of the things that I enjoy about that realization is that it's not a sustainable model. And so it's not going to last forever. The inception of what you've just described came from relativism, where it's like everything can be anything. So as long as that one person claims it is because of that, it just turns into who's going to scream the loudest about it because throw away reason, throw away any objective standard It's just who can yell more and who has 
the, the greatest threat backing whatever claim they've got. That's obviously not sustainable because it's not functional and it's going to fall eventually. Even the relativists might say something like, well, there's no absolute truths, which in and of itself is an absolute statement. So it's philosophically contradictory. It's functionally contradictory. And it's not something that we as a larger community can operate on. So I think we're starting to see the cracks in that model now, probably within another generation, a resurgence of an appreciation for absolute truth, I believe, will arise by necessity in in a few different ways, functionally from perhaps a a socioeconomic perspective, um, but then um, psychologically, because if everything can be anything, then nothing has consistent value to it, which is why I believe there's a lot of depression that folks are experiencing because there's a lack of meaning, because there's no actual foundation to place that meaning upon. I I like the idea of it's not sustainable, so it won't last forever. I guess I'm concerned about sort of the, the birth pains we will endure to, to birth the new reality. I think about that too. And I guess I go back to just inevitable suffering, that that's just part of life. And so when I think about these things, I go, okay, well, it's crazy right now. But then I think, well, what time in human history hasn't been crazy? It's just been a different flavor of crazy. You know, we look back at the medieval ages and you know, people chopping each other's heads off. I'm like, all right, that's a, that's a certain flavor of crazy there. Before that, there were different flavors of crazy. So it's, it's this flavor at this time, and it'll, it'll eventually find the way to the other side of the pendulum, and then back and forth we go, which is, I guess, part of what it means to be human. I feel like on the, the macro level, like in the world, we have this surge of feminine energy, which is manifest in the chaos we're all observing. I think men in their own lives react a couple of different ways to that surge of feminine energy. It gets shameful or they kind of bow up against it like an adolescent or they rise up to meet the challenge. And I think that's when the, where the father comes in. He's not afraid to stand and plant the flag and, you know, say no more. I, I agree. I think if I heard you the right way, it's the, as that demand increases, the supply on the on the masculine side will either respond in the boyish fashion or the fathers of the world will recognize that appropriately and recalibrate themselves to, to supply that demand. One thing that concerns me, though, and when I'm talking about feminine energy and masculine energy. I'm not talking about men and women specifically. Um, Yeah. Yeah. But that extreme of the feminine energy is that destructive kind of chaos. And the extreme of the masculine energy is the more tyrannical. Yeah. Because I said so. Yeah. Not loving father (laughs) energy. You had a great quote that said, history does not repeat itself. We do. Yes. Yeah. And I think about, you know, just even when I was a kid, communism was such a threat. I think what happens when you have this sustained rise in chaos, eventually people start to beg for a solution. And that's a great opportunity for the tyrant king to come and clamp down and take control. Yeah. And I'm so hoping that we can skip that step. I'm hoping that it won't get to that. I'm hoping that we'll rise up in love and learn to dance with each other again. Yeah, I agree. I think there's the duality that is the masculine and the feminine are inescapable. They best serve us when they're in balance synergistically, but obviously when they're not in balance and if it's too tyrannical on one end or too chaotic on the other end, it'll do more damage than anything. I think there's seasons of balance, but I don't know if they're ever truly in balance. As we in the, in the coming generations, whether that be one or two or more than that, make our way back to the other side of the pendulum. I yeah. guess it's probably just enjoying that season of balance before <laughs> before it shifts the other way and then back. Yeah. In relationship, it'd kind of be boring if it was balanced all the time. But mm-hmm. for me, being a feminine woman, if I never allow myself to flow yeah. over and have some structure and order to my life... I never get anything done. I'm just in that creative space all the time. And the same, you know, with our relationships, for example, I mean, sometimes it's fun and awesome to have that great 
flow. But then other times the masculine needs to be a little bit more dominant. So I don't know if it's ever really imbalanced, but maintaining that that flow and that dance, I think is is so important. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's it's perhaps it's never fully in balance in that way, but perhaps it's in a balanced playing field, meaning maybe one day you you score a few more points versus the next day the masculine scores a few more points or what have you, but it's within a balanced playing field. So I, I think there, there's that. And I can, I definitely experienced that with my wife where depending on the teamwork project at hand or the, the dance, sometimes she asserts a little more, or sometimes I assert a little more, therefore out of absolute balance. I, I think that kind of points into, you know, I don't know if there's a complete connection here, but this points towards the interpretation of power because a lot of what's led to this lack of balance that we see on a grander scale is the conflation of power being a masculine trait and now more a feminine trait. And it's interesting as I, as I thought about that and really started to reflect on like, where did that come from and what is power as it pertains to the masculine and the feminine? And it's, it's not as though there's one type of power for one energy. I think there's the masculine power is much different from the feminine power. I, I might associate the masculine power more with force, whereas the feminine power being more so with seduction. I was having this conversation a, a few years back and then I said, well, we were talking about how that might manifest in a relationship communicatively as well as intimately. And I was thinking about that exchange of power and I go, well, the, the, the male, or the, the masculine type of power is more so a push. It's more so a force. But the female, more so feminine type of power is more so a pull. I was thinking, okay, well, yeah, a man might, or uh, the masculine might assert himself onto his counterpart. Whereas the feminine power is, a, is more so I'm drawing that to me. I'm making it happen. And it, that realization help me to understand, well, it's not an exchange of power in any sense. It's how do these two powers dance together? And it's that push-pull exchange I think you were alluding to earlier when describing that dance. If you pull a man towards you with your feminine gravity, that's power. There's a power to that. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, if you look at you know, what you were describing, I mean, the act of making love, it is the receiving and the giving, the giving and receiving. And in that and allowing that, then it becomes a mutual giving and receiving because the woman is giving and the man is, is receiving also. But I think what it really comes down to is really respecting the different power instead of the women like the feminist movement is almost like we're a superior form of power and we need to feminize leaders. And I think that kind of comes from maybe a, ages of disrespect for feminine power. And so it kind of rose up. And now in the, the men's movement, this rise up of masculine power is superior. So if we, if we keep doing that, the pendulum will keep, keep swinging. But yeah. if you want to take the example of, of Christ, when he went before Pilate, Pilate said, hold on just a minute. And he called for his wife. What are you getting here? She said, I wouldn't touch yeah. it with a 10 foot pole. And that to me is a perfect example of that outer. I have the power. Your life is within my hands. I have the power, but I want to consult with this woman I want to consult with her deep intuition. I, I, I agree fully. I think having that counterbalance and that counsel is, is very important. I, I, I do think that throughout history, there, there have been great examples of feminine power versus masculine power at, at a governmental level or a cultural level. So for example, in ancient Egypt, a lot of those dynasties were matriarchal. Cleopatra, the, the phrase is she ruled the men that ruled the world. So it's like that was an example of how that went. And, you know, what can we take from that in terms of learning and applying it? Then in terms of um, a regard for the the feminine, going back to, to what I meant, referenced earlier, the, mid, the medieval ages, that was a, a time where culturally there was a high regard for the feminine. There were a lot of like, ah, my lady, 
may I please have this dance and I will, I will fight with the other knight for your hand in marriage type of romance came from. And so it's like at that time, the feminine was highly regarded as like there were actual knights fighting for the hand of, of, of a woman, you know? And it, so it's like, what can, what can we learn from that as well? It's yeah. Let's not swing to one side of the pendulum and, and conflate superiority beyond that, not to falsely justify doing it. One of the, one of the things that I've said is justification is the first page written in a story of destruction. It's like once you justify an inch, it's like, might as well just take the whole mile. We don't have to justify things that are right because they're, they're right. I really love that. Yeah. You said that maybe it was in your bio. I help leaders contain chaos and create value. Yeah. What do you mean by that? That, that I, I'd say is completely separate from the dichotomy that we've been describing. What, what I mean by that is going back to what prompted me into coaching being the decision making. If in our minds, we do not have a structured categorization of what our values are, how to process decisions, it's chaotic in our own minds. And therefore, if we can't organize our thoughts, our minds will become chaotic and our decision making will become chaotic and therefore our results will become chaotic as opposed to containing that structuring it and outlining exactly what our decision making variables are and executing on those appropriately for results and for our own performance. Yeah. I always say that this dance is within in your relationship and then macro in the world. And I feel like it it kind of is the same thing but just just within would you agree that, that that dance happens within also? Yeah, I, I think that's, I guess that's one of the things that I love is that these, these truths all have a, a nuanced um, component to them. And, and to answer your question, sure, yes, I would agree that in this context and with this nuance, that dance takes place at the internal level in that someone who's embodying order on one end and chaos on the other has to figure out what that balance is for themselves. If it's too much order, they'll restrict themselves and they won't make any decisions. So that, that might often be referred to as analysis paralysis. Whereas if it's not restrictive at all, there's no order and just all chaos in our thought processing, it'll just be sporadic and it'll be ad hoc. And that just leads to irresponsible business practice. You know, just kind of moving away from the idea of the feminine energy being female and the masculine energy being male, that we've all met tyrannical women and we've all met chaotic men. Yes. And yes. you know, if if you are if you are chaotic, sort of reining that in and adopting some more of the masculine structure and order in your life to to bring that balance to yourself as well. For, for sure. I, I think that's why having counsel is so important. So we, we discussed counsel in the relationship perspective, but then let's say I'm, I'm referring to a group of men and having that counsel from a tribe perspective. So using the king, warrior, magician, lover model, if you're a warrior and you're chaotic in yourself, we know that the negative poles of that are you're essentially going to become a sadist or a masochist. So you need your counterbalance from your counsel being a strong lover, a strong magician, a strong king near you to give you that that balance that you would otherwise not be able to generate for yourself. And if you tried to generate generate it with yourself, it would be fabricated. Yeah, and I'm really glad that you brought it back to that because I meant to say this earlier when you were talking about, you know, the masculine being more outward and the feminine being more inward. I think the key to the masculine, and this does, I think, apply to men, is that you are powerful. And without that voluntary surrender, and this goes back to the father, that voluntary surrender to something greater than yourself, that ultimate bowing of the knee to know that I am not God, then that power is unchecked and you can do all manner of evil in the world and in yeah. your relationship and in your own heart. But it's that voluntary surrender that makes it possible for, I think, a man to really thrive and become balanced 
in those quadrants. Yeah, yeah I, I think if I heard you the right way, it when you surrender power, you gain power. What I mean by that is if you surrender the self-imposed obligation to be fully autonomous, that is to say, play the role of God, you're going to, there's no way you can fulfill that responsibility. So it's like, if you surrender that power, you'll gain power back in relieving yourself of such a horrific burden of responsibility and therefore be a better steward of power in the long run anyway. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, wow. I, it's been so fun to, go over some of these concepts and, and principles with you. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for reciprocating the, this, this type of conversation. I think it's, it's, it's really healthy in sharpening our ability to leverage our strengths as, as men and women and to help serve others, men and women, especially as the larger sociocultural climate evolves more rapidly than perhaps we've ever seen it. But one thing that I really love about these conversations on the Mission Manhood podcast, a man and a woman discussing things. And as you said earlier, there's nuance. So I might have a great idea as a woman, but if I never have the opportunity to run it past a man that can say, wait a minute, that's not exactly right. Consider this little tweak. And then, wow, all of a sudden it makes sense. And then the same way, you might have an, a great idea that just with a little nuance, all of a sudden is you know, life-giving and, and powerful, but to have yeah. the opportunity to hold the space for each other. And uh, I really think modeling that respect for the differences is what we're so lacking in our culture today. So I appreciate you doing that. A hundred percent. Well, I, I think it, it, it begins with the recognition that those differences even exist because it's almost like frowned upon to even discuss those differences, but it's like, all right, well, then that goes back to relativism. We got to recognize the realities of this life and, and who we are to then play accordingly and be the best version of ourselves within a framework that is true. Otherwise, we're chasing our tails in an untrue framework. And I, yeah. I think that's what's happening right now. Yeah, and I love that what you said a little bit earlier, you can't really suppress or override who you are or who you were made to be. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of the frustration is, you know, not allowing ourselves to be who we were made to be and not being okay with that. A hundred percent. You know, and it's, it's funny how a statement like that can be so well accepted and then so well abused on another end. So if you say like, you know, accept who and what you are, that is to say, recognize what is inescapably human, that there's a very strong power in that. But then there's the abuse to that statement where folks might say, okay, well, I'm going to use that as license to do whatever I want and scapegoat my own self and just being whatever I'm claiming to be right now. That's, that's, that's the tough part. Can you let people know if they want to follow you on Instagram or your website, any information that you have that they can find you? Yeah. Just go to my website, which is Corey M Castillo.com. C O R E Y M C-A-S-T-I-L-L-O dot com. And you can get in touch with me, with, with me there. Okay. Thank you so much. I've, I love talking to you. Likewise. Thank you so much, Angela.